the number of people who were emigrating to Medina became too much to absorb by the people of Medina. So they needed a shelter. You see, the first batch of immigrants, every one of them was given a household. And the household basically adopted him for a while, took care of him until he got his own feet and then sent him his way, right? However, as the number of converts and the number of muhajirun and the number of people coming increased, the Prophet ﷺ could not handle all of them. So what happened? A public shelter was built. As soon as Muslims came, they would be housed in the masjid. The masjid became their house and the shelter became known as the suffa. And the people who remained there and lived there became the people of the suffa. How many people were in the suffa? Of course, the people of Sufa were always moving up and down quantity-wise. At times there were five or ten, at times there were up to seventy. Most of them would stay for a week or two, a few months. Anytime a delegation came and they didn't have a house to stay, they would stay in the Sufa. It is reported that sometimes towards the end of the life of the Prophet people would come just to learn Islam. Ibn Mas'ud says, anytime somebody came to us, the Prophet would assign one of us to the newcomer to teach him the Quran and Salah. We would teach him and then he would go back to his people. The covering of the Prophet was only at the back of the masjid for the people of the Sufa. And this shows us he prioritized them over even the regular Musallin. Because the regular Musallin did not have a roof for many years. But he was more concerned about them because they're living in the masjid. Whereas the rest of the people are just coming and going away. So the first roof to be built was actually the roof of the people of the Sufa. And of course, the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ literally became a university and a house and a masjid all in one for the people of the Sufa. The people of the Sufa had given up everything and they're living basically in a public shelter. They're living in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ with nothing because they gave it all up for the sake of Islam. There are many narrations about the problems and the difficulties that they faced, so much so that many of the people of the Sufa did not even have proper clothes to wear. So much so that there's actually an embarrassing hadith about this, but it shows you how poor they were. That the Prophet ﷺ, he had to make a general commandment to the women. That he said, O women, do not raise your heads up from sajda until some time has gone. Because the people of the Sufa, when they went into sajda, their aura would be exposed. Yani they didn't even have enough of what we would call basically even short. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ gave many a hadith about taking care of the people of the Sufa. When his own grandchild was born at Hassan, he told Fatima that, O oh Fatima, give some charity to the people of the Sufa. Some years later, when the Prophet ﷺ got a whole batch of prisoners of war who were going to become slaves, Fatima came complaining to the, her own father and said that, Ya Abati, I have so much housework to do. So she is complaining that Ali has so much housework that I have to do. Can't you give me a servant? Gift me one. SubhanAllah, what did the Prophet ﷺ do? He got irritated. And he said, how can I give you a servant when the people of the Sufa, their stomachs are collapsed. They have nothing to eat. And you want me to give you a servant? No, by Allah, I will sell all of them and spend the money on them. SubhanAllah. Every time some type of event happened, he would invite the people of the Sufa. And it is narrated the famous and the semi-humorous tradition of Abu Huraira. Of course, Abu Huraira is the most famous inhabitant of the Sufa. In fact, Abu Huraira says that many times, Abu Huraira is narrating this, that many times I would ask a companion a question when he went out of the masjid and wallahi, I knew the answer better than him. But the only reason I'm asking is to drag out the conversation until I get to his doorstep. Perhaps he might invite me in for a meal. He's too embarrassed to beg. Abu Huraira is the one who narrates that once the Prophet ﷺ saw me so hungry that I was weak with exhaustion, lying down in the sofa. And so he invited me to his house with him. And he asked Aisha, is there anything to eat or drink? And so Aisha said, yes, one of the neighboring Ansar has given us a glass of milk. Abu Huraira became happy, alhamdulillah, glass of milk. The Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Huraira, go and call the people of the Sufa. Abu Huraira, there's like 30, 40 people there, right? Abu Huraira is narrating the hadith that, فَمَا كَانَ لَنَا مِنْ بُدْ That I had to obey the command. That I went and I gathered together all the people of the Sufa. And they came to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ handed me the cup and said, go to every one of them and give them the cup, right? So I went to every one of them giving the cup and I thought to myself, what will be left for me? He really felt like, you know, he's going to be fainting from exhaustion and this is torture now. Until every single one of them finished. Until finally, there was only me and the Prophet ﷺ left who had not drank from that cup. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Ijlis. So I sat down. So he told me, Ishrab, drink. So I, and the cup he said was brimming as if it was more than when he handed it to me. So I drank. And then he said, Ishrab, drink again. So I drank. He said, Ishrab. Well, if I could call this a practical joke, I would, but it is a type of joke. 
So he said, Ma zala yukarriru. He kept on telling me, Ishrab, 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 until I said, Wallahi, O Messenger of Allah, there's not a single space left in my stomach that I have left for this milk, right? Then, after all of these 30, 40 people had drunk, the Prophet took the cup, the last, and then he drank from it. And it is said that one of the Sahaba, and he came up with an idea, and he said, why not anytime we get some food or some, we harvest some dates, we give a little bit of it to the people of the Sufa. And they said, this is a great idea, the Prophet ﷺ approved. So a string was hung between the two pillars of the Sufa, and any time the Ansar would harvest some dates, they would send the first batch. They would send it and they would put it on this string so that the people could eat without having to beg for it. And by the way, this string or this custom of having this lasted up until this century. And Abu Huraira deserves a few minutes of our attention, especially because of who he is. Abu Huraira is not from Mecca, Medina, he's from Yemen. And Abu Huraira came to Medina after the battle of Khaybar, i.e. after the seventh year of the Hijrah. And yet he is the number number one narrator of hadith. And Abu Huraira explained himself how this is the case. That Abu Huraira said, the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. The people are complaining that I narrate too many a hadith. But were it not for the fact that Allah has criticized those who withhold knowledge. <laughs> were it not for this fact, I would not have narrated one hadith to you. And I will tell you why I know more than our brothers of the Muhajirun and the Ansar. He said, as for the Muhajirun, they were busy throughout the day buying and selling in the souks of Medina. And as for the Ansar, they were busy in the cultivation and the field and harvesting. And as for me, then I would stick to the Prophet ﷺ with my hungry stomach. And therefore, I would memorize what they would not memorize. And by the way, Abu Huraira was not poor. Abu Huraira was from what we would call the middle class family. We know this because eventually his mother who was in Yemen, because she was, that was her only son, she moved to Medina, even though she was a pagan. And she purchased a house in Medina. Abu Huraira still did not go into that house and he remained in the Sufa. Why? The Sufa not only was a shelter, it became the first university of Islam. Abu Huraira was living in the dormitory of the University of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ is in the masjid more than he is in his own house. So Abu Huraira basically sticks to the masjid and by sticking to the masjid, he is able to be with the Prophet Sallallahu And even some of the Ansar moved into the Sufa. The most famous of them is Hamzala. Also, Ka'b ibn Malik al-Ansari. So many of the other Ansar are members of the Sufa. What does this show us? The Sufa isn't a freeloading shelter, astaghfirullah. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, Suhaib al-Rumi, Bilal ibn Rabah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. All of these are of course uh, Muhajirun. They moved into the Sufa even though they could have had a place to live. The Sufa is primarily a place of learning. And therefore, the people of the Sufa became legendary amongst the Muslims, amongst the Sahaba, for being the best of them. The most in memorization of the Quran, the most in tahajjud, the most in knowledge, in every single major battle amongst the top of the shuhada are the people of the Sufa. The battle of Ridda, the wars of Ridda, so many of the people of Sufa died that Umar ibn al-Khattab wanted to compile the Quran because the people of Sufa died. Large numbers of them. In one report it says more than 70 of them were killed. And so Umar went to Abu Bakr and said, Ya Abu Bakr, we have lost many of our Qurra, many of the people of the Sufa. And they were all memorizers of the Quran. And I'm worried that unless you do something, if more of the Qurra die, we won't have the Quran. And so Abu Bakr basically agreed to compile the Quran, primarily because the people of Sufa died. Think about the status of Sufa then, and how it's associated with the Quran. And the Sufa remained up until the time of the Prophet ﷺ's death. And then of course after this, the Sufa did not retain that status that it used to retain.